So that's the 15th Amendment. And if you read this, did we get right to the bell when we said this? And so what's missing from this? Yeah, there's no right to vote. There's no right to vote. All it says is you can't have your vote taken away based upon race, on uh, color, or previous servitude. So that's for U.S. citizens. By the way, that's where you get the whole thing about the 14th Amendment not defining women as citizens. Therefore, by the right of citizens to vote, that meant men. And you have no right to vote in the United States of America to this day. No place in the Constitution does it say you have the right to vote. All it says is you can't have that taken away. And for example, states cannot deprive 18 year olds from voting or women from voting, but it, you have no right to vote. And what that means is, sure, if they don't put down, you know, old, you know clad people can't vote, you know, something like that, you know, on color of skin or, you know, former slaves can't vote or descendants of slaves. Okay, maybe that might violate the 50th Amendment. But that means there's a lot of other ways to deny people the vote, to simply make it more difficult to vote, make a bunch of hoops, and do they have to count your votes? No, they do not have to count your votes. It doesn't say that. It's implied, but no. So how many votes do they throw away every election? Millions of votes they throw away every election. So you have no idea if your votes counted or not. Now, probably is, but do you see the holes here? These are big holes. The 15th Amendment does not give you the right to vote to this day. And that is why in this country it is relatively difficult to vote. In fact, I was explaining it to my, so my sister married a Berliner, so they're here over the break. They got just had a, a hell flight um, Saturday and Sunday back to Berlin. It was a nightmare. So all I can say is I'm glad I was here. But I was telling him how he was asking me about voting here. And I was telling him about the hoops we have to jump through to go through the vote and the lines and everything else to vote and how difficult it is. Just blew them away. We just vote. You're registered right away and all this stuff. Just couldn't believe how easy it was for them to vote and how hard it was here. And uh, um, Germany. But moving on. So there's no right to vote. So how quickly will they find these loopholes and deprive people of the vote? As soon as the military left. Yes. And do they exist to this day? Sure. There's all kinds of hoops to vote. It'd be more difficult for you to vote than it was for me to vote. But that was your end. And of course, women's rights groups are furious. Susan B. Anthony actually ran for president in 1872. So furious that women were not denied the vote. She said, very good, well, citizens come out. Well, you're not a citizen. You're a woman. You're counted as a person. I guess there's some rights. I mean, hey, what do you want? And so that's the 15th Amendment. Yes, it's an important amendment. It was kind of on purpose and also just accidental. It was, but they just, they did not want it, the problem of the right to vote. So with that, Johnson though was gonna be impeached. And very quickly I'll tell you what happened. He did everything he could to make sure that military reconstruction wouldn't happen. And there's a lot of racism in the United States at this time, but wow, did he blatantly attempt to disable constitutional laws through racism. And he started doing these rallies, and they were just drunken messes where he accused Republicans of being traitors, of destroying the country, of going to make um, white slaves. These rallies all over in 1867, 1868. They were kind of shocking, mostly in the North, to kind of raucous crowds. But then there was this law passed by Congress, probably unconstitutional, but that's neither here nor there, called the Tenure of Office Act, and which said the president couldn't fire cabinet officials. Well, he fired Secretary of War Stanton, who's caricatured right here, and two generals to try to to try to undermine Reconstruction. Well, that would be the excuse. All they need 
to impeach a president is a majority. Okay, all is a lot, but a majority in the House. So he was impeached. Later on, they would find 14 counts. Now, the Tenure of Office Act is pretty iffy, but hey, this is a political act. They can impeach for any reason they want. They don't like the president's uh, look. They can impeach him technically, even though obviously that's a big step. But by but blatantly disobeying and undermining a, a, a law passed by Congress, which is the number one duty of the president to carry out these laws, that's enough to impeach. And there was a, a growing measure of corruption by allowing for former Confederates. But then it goes to the Senate for trial. So impeachment is basically an indictment. So the trial was this raucous affair. All these people got tickets, they stood and cheered or booed. Um, it's actually pretty shocking. You know, this has never been happened before. And you need two thirds, you need two thirds of a vote to get rid. They were one short. Part of the reason was there was an election coming up. We're gonna get rid of them anyways. Yes. The last one, they impeached him 14, 14 times, the House did. Impeached them, they gave him 14 accounts. Let's say accounts, 14 counts. So he had to be tried, that to go yes or no vote. And the one for violating the military reconstruction act, one vote short for moving him from office. One vote short. So the election's coming up, we're gonna get rid of him anyways. Which of course, Probably not the soundest reason. If you really, if the members of the House really believe that the president should be removed from office for committing a crime, you better remove him from office. Because if you don't, what will that encourage down the road? Huh? More crimes, without a doubt. If you're not punished for an act you make, you will probably do it again. Not you, the people out there. We learn in here, correct? We would never do that again. But there's also just fear. Fear, fear, maybe a Republican might be impeached. Because it's relatively easy to impeach. It's very difficult to, to convict. And it's a lot of just kind of gutless. Oh no, I, I don't want to answer for this. You know, let's just let it kind of go away, which I can empathize with, but it's sort of unfortunate in a way. And so with that. In 1868, the Republicans and Grant will sweep the elections. This referendum on Reconstruction was huge. North, the North was behind this. And they would remain behind it in 1872. A Republican sweep, partially because Southern Republicans. Now, this map blew a Republican. Remember the blue state, red state thing is a relatively new thing and kind of silly. Now, today that came out of the election of 2000. But these blue are Republican. And look how well Grant did in the South. Why? Mostly freedmen under military protection could vote. And the Republican Party was strong. But add one more thing. Democrats, which were all white, at this time, boycott. They just didn't go. And they're going to realize in those years, from about 1870 to 1876, if we boycott this, we'll never get back in the We lost. The war is over. Maybe we can come back in the peace. Oh, and they will. And this was a really confusing election. And we're not going to go into all the details of 1872. So with that, one thing though, eventually seven, almost all freedmen, people of African descent would be elected to the House and the Senate, most famously Hiram Rebels right here in the Senate, and he would take the seat last occupied by Jefferson Davis. One of the strange little quirks in history. And there were many members of various state houses that were freedmen. South Carolina for a while was completely taken over by freedmen. And so a radical shift in the South took place. That of course is going to be crushed without mercy. 
So Republican rule, though, in the South, it really was rebuilding, emphasizing on schools, really emphasizing schools. And this concept of an education for all. Now, public education existed, but it's without a doubt that Reconstruction set this ideal of public education. And so there's going to be a real movement against public education that is going to have its roots in the South and still exists there today. But the big thing is, it is about the 15th Amendment and about voting, but it's taxes. Taxes are going to pay for these things and other public services. Courthouses and eventually building the roads, the improvements of government facilities for all people. It's going to cover taxes. And that is going to be the way that Democrats are going to attack this. They're going to tax you to death. But here's the big to give money to them. Those people. And everybody knew who them were. So with that, so the Republicans, though, had the feeling that they were the dominant party. Now, they actually weren't. The Democratic Party was still really strong in the North. And this weird thing that the Democratic Party is going to become by the turn of the century, which exists kind of to this day, will exist. But they start to call themselves the GOP. Anybody know what the GOP stands for? Yeah. Grand yeah, the Grand Old Party. Even though they're not as old as the Democrats, the implication is, you know, we keep winning and winning. We're the Grand Old Party. So I will refer to the, the Republicans sometimes as GOP just because I'm just kind of used to it. That's what I heard for my whole life. But they very much at this time would tie themselves to civil rights. Now, other things too. The Republican Party, like the Democrats, is very complex. Ideologies are all over the place. But this is where this, you know, the Grant Party, the elephant, Thomas Nass cartoon, which I showed you before. And you'll notice Union. This is a post-war. And that's stomping on the Democratic machine in New York. But opponents would take this and say, all they care about is civil rights for freedmen and not you. And that's where, okay, they used to term black Republicans for the free soul Republicans before the war, but the black Republicans would come out. And look at this caricature. Taking the elephant and this. This is a Democratic Party, and this is New York City. In New York City, they're not Democrats there weren't dumb per se. They knew we need Southern Democrats to win a national election. And that same horrific caricature I showed you before. And you notice the connection, right? But this is really Bacon's rebellion thinking. Remember Bacon's rebellion and the slave codes that came out of it. To divide the people, the indentured servants and the slaves, there was all kinds of different people who were slaves, and then the, uh, the former indentured servants had that little piece of land called head rights. To divide them, they told those poor, you don't have much, but you have one thing. One more became color. And it's the same kind of thinking. Same kind of thinking. If they get rights, you lose rights. But it's a zero sum game. There's only so many rights in this world. It's like a big bowl of rights. rights. <laughs> and if they scoop out your rights, you lose. So this is where we get the term scowl weapons. And those are what Democrats in the South call Southern Republicans. And they were mostly uh, freedmen. But there's also going to be, what is the term for Northerners who came south? The derogatory term. But Northerners went south. For whatever reason, people move in, move out. And so here, that is a, that's implying carpetbagger, forcing a good Southern wife to shine the shoes of a freedman. And here is a Democratic Party poster showing the Democratic Party, the Republican Party. Not very subtle at all. Now, of course, Republicans would respond with that the Democrats are a bunch of traitors. And they're the ones who started the Civil War. Needless to say, if you have this kind of rhetoric, it's hard to come together and say, hey, let's agree on things. 
By the way, have you ever heard of the term waving the bloody shirt? And that is when you accuse your opponent of being a traitor. Do you know what it means? They would literally come in, Republicans would come into a Democratic Party meeting and they take a shirt, they, like, a, like an undershirt, implying it could be a Union soldier shirt. Sure. And they dump like pigs or cows' blood on it, so it's bloody shirt. They literally wave it and said, This was the blood of a patriot that you traitors spilled. You killed them. Needless to say, these this elections, this was a nasty time. So that's where we get the Klan to come in. That would use terror to keep blacks from voting. This, is, this was a terrorist group, but their number one goal, keep them from voting. Well, their another goal I'll tell you in a sec. And that's Nathan Bedford Forrest, the first grand wizard of it. He actually would leave it because it got too violent for him, which is saying a lot. And so murder, beating up, lynching. But here is the hanging. This is just a threat to scalawags. But I love the Cal carpetbagger, and you notice Ohio. Now, not because Ohio is in the north, but that's where Grant was from. So that's the, we're going to get Grant. Grant's a complex guy. So with that, and this is where you get the term black misrule. Now, I saw in the video very well, but the important thing was groups at the Klan, the Democrats, wanted to destroy government. Hobble it. If government can't function, then what can they turn around and say? Look what happens if you give them power. Harper's Magazine was relatively pro voting rights of freedmen. But by the 1870s, this is a colored rule in Reconstruction State. And look how they draw the faces. And here's Lady Liberty um, cannot stop this disaster that's happening. And there's one more thing that's really important. You see the white people in the back who have no voice and imply that look at the misrule. This fits into that positive good theory and they're savages and it's holding his nose. They're dirty too. Horrifically racist, and it's ama amazing how fast it turned around. Yes, Northern View would turn here. Oh, there's a carpetbagger bribing a black veteran to vote Republican. And the big thing is they can't go. But the most important thing is they would use, they're going to take your tax money and waste it. They're going to pocket it, they're corrupt, they're going to buy it, um, they're just going to give money. And look, remember the, what is the bureau that was created to help people, help Friedman? I just said it. <laughs> Friedman's bureau. Same deal. You give them money and they won't work. There'll be two more Civil Rights Acts. One's called the KKK Act, and that was literally, they, they sent reinforcements of cavalry down to the South. Many of them were the so-called the colored regiments. And they destroyed the Klan. They destroyed the Klan. The Klan would disappear by 1873. It's gone. No more Klan. It would come back with a vengeance in the teens of the 20th century. And this kind of just rebirth of just unbelievable height of racism at that time. But it was more not just racist against people, um, people who weren't white, but also anti immigrant, anti athlete, anti, -anti, -anti Jew. There's an element of anti Mormonism too. And it was really big. Yeah. There's still a clan, you know, it's relative, it's not that strong, but there's still members. When it made its big reemergence in the in the 20th century, at first it was mostly in northern and plains. There was almost no clan in the south. It was pretty big in Montana. That was pretty big. Yeah, it was really big. Um, they ran, the clan in Helena ran out of most black Chinese and American Indian citizens of Helena, ran them out of town in the teens. So, 75, there would be the last Civil Rights Act, and it was never really enforced for 89 years. Okay, there would be a Civil Rights Act of 57, but it had no teeth. 
would not be to one of the most important laws in American history, the Civil Rights Act of 64. No discrimination based upon race, creed, religion, national origin, or sex. 64 is a big law. And this is the beginning of the end of Reconstruction right here, the last Reconstruction. Racism really began to pick up both the North and the South for various reasons. We'll talk about this a little more in the North, but racism re really exploded in the North because of the desire to keep people who were free to go North. We'll talk about sundown towns and things like that in the South to control the people who are free. So Reconstruction ends. A few reasons really quickly why it ended. The first one, I can't emphasize this enough, the Panic of 1873. This huge depression that arguably lasted six years, but you'll see some people say basically, this is gonna be a 27 year depression. The economy never really picked up. And this was worldwide chaos. That would lead to the big railroad strike, and this is a very stylistic drawing of the great upheaval in 77, which was revolution. It was huge, unprecedented. So you can imagine Northerners are saying, we have our own problems, let's not worry about the South. Does that make sense? Two, Grant. The Grant administration was known for corruption and a lot of it was justified. This is going to be called Grantism. The most famous is the Credit Mobile scandal. And because Grant was the most prominent person trying to finish Reconstruction, here he is weighted down by all the scandals. Not only would that make sure he only would be president for two terms, but it discredited Reconstruction. If the Grant administration is, is corrupt in, like, the sale of whiskey and whiskey licenses, they must be corrupt in Reconstruction. Grant was not personally corrupt, but he delegated to people who work, which makes him an unfortunately inept president. Next, there's just racism in the North. They're tired of Reconstruction. And there's a real feel that there was misrule and they, and freedmen will come North. And so here's another Harper's one showing the misrule after this is attacking democracy. Well, look who you give votes to in the South, and these, the horrible character, car caricature of an Irish immigrant. So they're becoming kind of, we have too much democracy. We're letting these people vote. And here, bribing Irish immigrants or freedmen with whiskey. They're just tired of saying, this is corrupt government, we just got to get rid of it. It's over. And then the biggie, though, redeemer governments. Now, put that white rule, but this is democratic rule. Make sure you understand this is the democratic party in the South. Every party has some uh, uh, skeletons in their closet. And this is redemption. They also sometimes call them bourbon rule, as the wealthy elite in New Orleans were called bourbons. And so here, same deal. This is from a, a congressional race in Virginia, the two platforms, Democratic, Republican. And even though both people running were of European ancestry, you know exactly what that means. Here, implying here is trying to reestablish white rule, and look what's happened when you let them in charge. And it pretty much was them, not us. And this is supposed to be the Constitution, like good rule, but you notice it's on a tablet to make it kind of look like the Ten Commandments, to make it almost like they've uh, uh, broken some kind of co sacred covenant. And also notice, what is he dressed as? A prison. Therefore, they're corrupt convicts. So with that, and what is the big element of this Redeemer rule? It was very much an effort to try to unify the wealthier white groups that were in charge before and poor whites. And once again, that is Bacon's rebellion thinking. 
John Dutel, the floor of the South, you're closer to the white rule than freedmen. Just like after Bacon's Rebellion, indentured servants are closer to the white burgesses than the slaves. And then a lot of anti-tax rhetoric. They're going to tax you to death. And the white supremacy in the South at that time, they very openly talked about white supremacy. Very openly. But we'll get rid of your taxes. They're just paying for these horrible schools and roads. So these are the years that military reconstruction ended. So by 1876, 1876, only Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina, only three states had military reconstruction. Every place else there have been redeemer governments that have taken over. And almost immediately, the Republican Party was destroyed. And every state that got rid a military rule, I mean, just overnight, the Republican Party began to disappear. There be a few little um, fits of the Republican Party in places like North Carolina in the 1790s, or 1890s, but it would be over. Not until the 1960s. So the 1876 election is a big one. The Republicans would nominate Rutherford B. Hay, a war hero, another Ohioan, the state of presidents. He was untainted by Grantism, even though, you know, kind of would be. The Democrats nominated the next governor of New York, Samuel Tilden. So the Democrats did try to do, remember the dough face thing? It's kind of the same thing, even though it's a little more complex. The Democratic Party was kind of all over the place. Urban, farmers, uh, Southern conservatives who wanted to maintain white rule. I mean, it's just a weird conglomeration. This was a nasty, nasty election. Black Republicans, the Democrats called them, waved the bloody shirt against them. Nasty. But when the election outcome came, I don't even need to tell you what states. Oh, once again, blue Republican, red Democrat. I really hate the red state, blue state thing. It always annoys me, but I think it's kind of here to say. You guys have never known anything different. <laughs> so it annoys me. I just found it, I just didn't even think about it when I got this map. So look at all the Republican or look at all the Democratic states. But you can tell where did military reconstruction end? Where was it maintained? The vote, now remember, the popular vote doesn't matter. Presidential elections are not national elections. They're not. It's individual elections in every little state, and the winner gets all of the what? Electors. So, this doesn't matter. Even though Tilden won the popular vote, it goes here. The electoral vote was 184 to 168. Yet these three states sent two sets of electors. 17 for Tays. 17 for Tilden, and Congress didn't know what to do. And they needed 185 to be the majority. So Tilden was one short of being president. So this is gonna to go to what we call the crisis of 77. What do you do? Florida, South Carolina, Louisiana, that's contested electorate. Now, even with military rule, it was getting pretty lax. Probably the Democrats won at least one of those states. At least one. But they weren't sure. Now, let's be clear about it. Part of the reason they won is because of intimidation of Republican, especially black voters. But they picked a 15-member committee. And after some shuffling, the committee turned out to be eight Republicans and seven Democrats. And guess what the eight Republicans versus seven Democrats, what did they vote? Eight to seven that all 17 electors would go to whom? Hayes. All 17. 
So Hayes was elected president by one vote. Or was he? Southerners, but especially all Democrats, but especially Southerners, went nuts. And they vowed, we will make sure that nothing is ever passed in the Senate. We will gum up the works, much like today. We will make sure nothing is done. And thus will lead to the Compromise of 1877. And what happened was, Democrats agreed, okay, we'll let Hayes be president. And what ended? Military reconstruction ended. They abandoned Reconstruction and therefore civil rights. There's a Southern Postmaster too. This was a big deal. Postmaster General was a plum government job. Now, it did not end immediately in 1877. It's going to take over the next 20 years. But by the end of the century, all of the rights that freedmen, that blacks wanted, paid such a horrible price for, would be lost. So the Republicans, they made a choice. The Republican Party would shift. And they decided they wanted allies to protect big business, or more and more, they would just simply say capital, those who had the wealth, the big business, over equality. They wanted allies for a higher tariff. So they wanted Southern allies. It was a deal. You vote for a tariff, we'll shut our eyes about reconstruction. And so here's a cartoon showing Grant and Reconstruction destroying the South. And here is the South prospering once it got rid of Reconstruction. Was it like this? Depends on who you refer to. To majority population, no. For the those in charge of the South, yeah. And so what if the economy of the South? Do you remember how Sherman gave them land, the land in South Carolina, and that whole idea is maybe they'll get a little bit of land and 40 acres in a mule. In fact, that became the slave. And people, I've heard people say this, that slaves got 40 acres in a mule. No, they got nothing, as we said before. No compensation ever for the hell they went through. Or their descendants got nothing. It's actually kind of mind-boggling. But you could have, you could be kidnapped and enslaved and worked to death your family members worked to death, soul, family broken up, and nothing. There's an article in the New York Times uh, today. There's been research done. Over 1,700 members of Congress were slaveholders. Is that kind of mind boggling? The last one would die in 1928. But here's the thing plantation owners had lots of land. But they had no who had labor, who could work but had no land. Freedmen and also poor whites, but had their hands. And so you have this vacuum that's being created. Yes, Reconstruction did a lot, but it really was a vacuum. Like nobody really knew what to do. I have some empathy for it, and that is where we get. The development of tenant farmers. Now, there's always been tenant farmers. That's where serfdom comes from. That's where all kinds of stuff. But here's the thing tenant farmers, especially freedmen, but also poor whites, could rent some of this plantation owning land. They could rent it. They rent. That makes sense? Rent. So they'd be renters. That gets technically gets rid of two problems, kind of. So, they'd have to borrow everything. They'd have to borrow. And they needed collateral for their loan. I meant to put down loans, but just put down loans. Because they had to borrow. Think about it. They had to borrow seed, maybe a plow, a mule, clothing. This might shock you, but you actually people need to eat. 
So you might have to borrow food. Now, do you understand what a collateral is? You borrow to pay your rent, and then farmers, when can they pay their rent? Yeah, so at one time a year, basically, when your crop is done. So the collateral is if you can't pay back your land, your rent, or I'm sorry, you can't pay back your debt, you lose your collateral. So what's your only collateral? They don't have any collateral, do they? Except for one thing. You ever got that? The profits are collateral. A lien is a contract that a bank forces a debtor to sign, saying if you don't pay back your loan, they get their crop. That's why you, when you go into debt, you sign your life away for that debt. They will put a lien on it. You borrow, a, month, um, you borrow money for a house called a mortgage. They have a lien on your house until you pay back that mortgage. It's a lien. And you miss your payments. What happens? They take your house. It's a lien. You borrow money for anything. I know people who have bought, bought cars and put a lien on their house to buy a car. Just like, no, don't. If you miss one payment, you lose your house. I know someone who did it for a boat. That's a bucket of stupid right there. But if you really wanted a boat, they like water skiing. Do you see the problem with this? First off, who are they borrowing money from? There's no banks in the South. There's no money. From whom? The plantation owners. So you're borrowing money. So everyone got that. You're borrowing money for the very same people you owe the rent to. Are they ever able to pay back their debts? All it takes is one bad year. One bad year. And what? You can't pay back for this year, so what do you got to do to make it through the next year? Borrow more. So now you owe double. Are you going to be able to pay that back after that crop? No. So what do you got to do? Borrow more. Borrow more. And this is going to be called the crop lien system. Now I think you can imagine where this is going to go. From you owe. You owe your debt back and your crop is collateral to they just get your crop. And what do we call that? Oh, I almost forgot the cycle of debt. By the way, the cycle of debt is a pretty scary thing. Once you're in a lot of debt, it's really hard to get out. And that's why um, college being so expensive is such a crisis for this generation of 20 and 30 year olds. Because it's so more expensive, so much more expensive than uh, the generation before or my generation before that, uh, that they started to have a big bunch of debt. So they it's hard to get out of that debt. So they're always just kind of treading water. It's a really difficult thing. That's it, that's a political decision that this country made. That sharecropping. So it went from you pay back your debt to just give it a part of your crop. And pretty soon, the darker the color, the greater percentage of sharecroppers. The vast majority of freedmen became tenant farmers to sharecroppers. But not just then. This was a way poor whites too. So the poor were locked in this system of sharecropping. You got to share of your crop. And here's the thing. If you got to give a share of your crop, and every year your debt goes up, that share goes up. They don't want you to grow food. What do they want? Do you see a problem? So tomorrow we have a little left to finish up with this. Get to the west. Have a great day. Thank you. See ya. I gotta type in death. I forgot to type that in. Oh, I love these Thank you. Don't forget your computer and all that stuff for tomorrow.